newer all the time. I saw this a few years ago, but I understand it's been much improved. This, yeah. The occupational safety uh, lab that they have now in their uh, in their department looks very interesting. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's a work in progress forever, which we'll keep adding to it, but we'll talk about it. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm, I'm really excited. This is my first uh, Runny Nose Conference. I, I, you can thank uh, Dr. Sussick again for that. Uh, so um, we all work together on this. Uh, Fidel has done some great work supporting our teams down the, in the lab, and Richard as well. Uh, we have, we currently have a senior design team down there doing great safety project. It's a success, including safety, so great work we're doing in the lab. And John Evans, he's not with us today, but he's really a driving force behind this, and so it, it's really, uh, we have a lot of fun with it. So we'll get to it. I think I'm going the wrong direction. So, yeah. Okay, so this gentleman made this quote. Knowledge is something you buy with money. Wisdom is something you acquire by doing. To understand means to be able to do. So the question is, do, do we listen to this guy? Does anybody know who this is? It's Taichi Ono. Taichi Ono is the father of the Toyota production system or lean manufacturing, as it's commonly known. Uh, he is the Henry Ford of Japan. <coughs> so I think we should listen to him. I think he has a great idea about this. So Auburn's approach to experiential learning uh, is to simulate real world processes from concept to completion. So we actually have a lab where we build a product from raw stock inventory to final delivery. And because of that, it presents all kinds of opportunities for research to be conducted within that lab. Essentially, we're giving the students a sandbox to play in. Students focus on outcomes with as few constraints as possible. So we kind of encourage them to think and innovate. Short duration, in-class projects coupled with extended out-of-class exploration, OSC integrated into the full curriculum. So motivations and goals. First one, have students graduate with 10 years of industry experience, if you know what I mean. And in a lot of cases, that's not that difficult. So, but we still have a lot of work to do to do that. But we really genuinely believe they will be equivalent to a 10-year industry experienced employee when they exit, if we do this well and continue to do it well. And this sounds a little rude, but it's important. Embarrass visiting manufacturers. Shouldn't we do that? Really? I mean, we're an academic institution. We should be teaching them, right? So if we're going to do that, we have to have them tour our facility and hang their head a little bit and go, oh, wow, there's some things that we could learn from them. So that's what we're trying to do. Fulfill the mission of a land-grant university, which Auburn is. Represent the spirit of Auburn creed, which begins with, I believe that this is a practical world. This is the creed. And we'll kind of touch on some of those quotes throughout the creed. Very important to us. And here is, uh, oh, oh, oh. This is our product. We build two cars, very complex, over 250 pieces per unit. We have to have two because you've got to introduce the complexity into this operation because it offers a lot of teaching opportunity, the complexity itself. So we have a customer, customer demand of 200,000 cars per year. We have three cells, five workstations per cell. Two of them are U-shaped and one of them straight line. We run three production runs per semester, obviously coupled with classroom. Uh, experience as well as on hands-on experience in the lab. So the three production runs are your intelligent industrial engineers, build a car every 65 seconds for me. Show me. And so they do. They do okay and, and they fail somewhat, somewhat miserably on quality actually. And we're happy that happens. We'd hate to see them do a great job the first time because obviously we wouldn't have a lot to teach them. And then we do the second production run, which is lean system design. So we're teaching them lean manufacturing. We're implementing the system. And about mid-semester, they've got to produce 30 cars in 30 minutes or something, 25 cars in 30 minutes. And then the last production run of the, of the semester is the Kaizen run, which is really involved with continuous improvement systems, well-structured, well-managed, well-led, and with the, with the focus on people, 
people being the critical element in a world-class operation. So we teach them why that's important and how you connect to the people that do the work and you convert the waste that they identify for you. So we didn't like that red car because there's a university up the road from us we're not exactly crazy about. So we were playing around with a prototype. We painted it blue and we, we liked that much better. Uh, or we could take that red Right, we think that looks pretty good. Richard had a lot of influence on that design. Um, so the Auburn Creed. Um, I believe in education which gives me knowledge to work wisely and trains my mind and my hands to work skillfully together. So I, I know this so sounds funny, but I believe in education, one plus one is three. And of course, of course, what we're talking about is the synergistic impact where this, the total is greater than the sum. And so we incorporate our curriculum within to this environment, this complete system, from raw stock to final delivery. And we've incorporated the safety uh, uh, discipline within it as well. So this is a photo of one of the cells, just as an example. And uh, this, I'm going to play a few videos through here, so I'll kind of narrate a little bit. But this is just uh, showing you the students working in the lab trying to achieve 25 cars in 30 minutes. So think about that. You've got a car with 277 parts. You're standing at the end of the line, and every 65 seconds, one comes off the line completed. And that's what they have to accomplish. So it's very difficult to do. In the car, and I say this and people laugh at me, this car is much more difficult to build than a car in an assembly plant. Much more difficult. I worked in an assembly plant. Trust me. If I'm putting an alternator on an engine, I can't stick it anywhere on the engine. It can only go in one place. And if you're building cars for the public, you can't have processes where you can fail regularly. So we have a real difficult time trying to build quality into this process. So it really presents a, a real challenge for us. So these are the results of last year's production runs. So this is cell one, cell two, cell three. They're trying to achieve 25 units in throughput. And you can see how they performed on the mass production run. And then when you look at we implement the lean system. I kind of hoped it'd be a little better than that. But you know, you can't expect the lean system to necessarily give you great performance. It gives you a system. The difference comes when you start engaging people. So we teach them about that. We have our gra graduate students are the team leaders. The undergraduate students work the process. And the graduate students must work with them to identify all the reasons they can't achieve the objective. They must document them all. They must assign responsibility and timing and solve them before our last run. And this is what happens. And if you talk to anybody in lean, including Taiichi Ono, if you're still here with us today, he would say people are the most important element of a manufacturing operation, by far. And it's just not a nice thing to say. It really is the competitive advantage. So some things that we do in here, additive manufacturing to pokey oak or airproof process. Now this helps us with safety because when you make mistakes, you build cars out of process, you repair them offline, people get injured building cars offline. So building it right the first time, not allowing a defect to proceed in the process is a safe practice. So we've used additive manufacturing because remember I told you this is almost impossible to build without defects. So what we're doing is we're creating check fixtures that take no more than two seconds. So we've got to allow time for that to where they can mate, validate, see that every part's in the proper position and no parts are missing before they transfer to the next process. So they're building judoka, they're building quality and station, which is a primary pillar of the lean production system and a safe way to do business and a very organized way to do business. So this is uh, an example. Single minute exchange of dyes, another primary method of just-in-time manufacturing, which is the other pillar of lean. But look at the ergonomic problem of this changeover. 
This is a five minute changeover. It happens every 20 minutes if we were to run the full shift. Uh, so I'm not saying that we, wouldn't, we couldn't have come up with maybe a, a little better way to do it, but we're demonstrating this to students and they don't really realize that this is a, not necessarily optimal. <laughs> so they have to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna advance the car one piece at a time and we're gonna greatly reduce whip inventory and we're gonna improve lead time to the customer, we cannot have long changeovers. So this is a SMET implementation and the students actually came up with this methodology. They designed it in CAD, they cut these wax uh, fixtures in our design and manufacturing lab, implemented it and reduced the five minutes down to five seconds. That allows us to take the whip inventory out of the process and reduce the lead time. It makes the operation of changeover much safer and much more ergonomically friendly. So this is really cool, Fidel. Now the students, they, they, they're playing in the sandbox, but they had the idea, you know, I think, I think we, we make so many mistakes. If we could vision inspect this car, we would know before we transfer it that it had a, a, an error on it. So Fidel helped them with their own camera in their pocket and MATLAB software to actually inspect the car in a fixed position and tell them when there's a defect on the car. And that came from their, their excitement almost as children playing in the sandbox and they want to see what they can come up with. So with some guidance, with some support, directed by the student's interest and passion, we come up with a great example of what could be done very cheaply in process. So that's pretty cool. And I could never help them do this. I have no idea how you do this, but yeah, I love it. Okay, so this uh, simulation. A lot of you are probably familiar with simulation ma simulating manufacturing environments. And I believe this was your graduate student. Yeah, just great. Student's great. Amazing. Anyway, he's showing the as assembly sequence of the Lego car itself. This just a, probably could help us with standardized work if we had video work instruction and station. Um, and now here's our lab. That's a pretty good representation of the lab. That says Tom. I'm Tom. That's not a good representation of me. <laughs> He really does walk that. <laughs> uh, so here it's really the, uh, uh, the uh, as you can see, the uh, software being utilized to calculate the efficiencies using simulation to look at all the uh, alternative approaches. So again, another student saying, hey, I think we should do a simulation of this to try to demonstrate that we have the uh, opportune way to make this work. The design and manufacturing lab, uh, he is one of our Previous OSC students, he's PhD, he teaches this. Uh, he does all kinds of actual cutting of metal and uh, CNC. All the mechanical engineers go through this and it's an extremely safe, well-documented environment. He is obsessive compulsive about safety. Guess what? They, they learn a great lesson about safety in a work environment from this guy. And they also learn how to, uh, how to machine metal. And this, we do a lot of projects with companies where we select some of our students, we put them out there and we agree upon work to be done. And this just goes to show you that many of these projects with these companies, our students are either hired or they're made an offer and then they don't like the place so they go somewhere else. But most of them, most of them are offered. Uh, I won't go through this, but we got this today. I thought I'd throw it up here. This is with a healthcare provider senior vice president was so impressed, they think that they can implement their suggestions immediately. And we think, because of how we're engaging them, they come up with great solutions like this. This is Baxter. I don't know if you got a patent on it yet, right? But anyway, <laughs> it really just, it, it biomechanical issues with lower back strain and demonstrates to uh, students the impact of that and you use it with, uh, and we also use it in class. It's got a fish scale on the back that reads out the force in the back muscle from different bows and postures. So it, it, it's pretty cool. And it creates a lot of interest in our program with a lot of students that are interested in coming. Uh, 
This is, uh, you can probably talk to this, a respirator project. Yeah, this is, um, this was incorporated into three different classes. This is the, uh, the work methods class, actually did time motion studies. You see how long it actually takes to properly don an escape hood for like a tall building escape. And the standards, they're actually voluntary standards on this, and they say 30 seconds. Well, when we did this with actual people watching videos first and practicing, it wasn't until they did it three times that they were actually fast enough to do it in 30 seconds. And instructions are on the outside the box. As soon as you open the box, you lose your instructions. Um, it's just kind of an interesting project. So we did, mo we did a time study in a regular work, IE work methods class with the safety output. We also looked at it in the industrial hygiene class. And we're looking at the human factors class because it's a visibility issue because of where the respirator is located. You can't see the stairs. If you're going downstairs in a building, now you've got to bend over forward. So it slows you down and makes it more likely to trip. So. So, part of the creed, I believe in Auburn and I love it. We think strong educational foundation, experiential learning, and our industry partnerships, we fulfill our Auburn creed. That's really what we're trying to do. Uh, we all have a pretty good idea of how to disengage students. And I'm hoping I'm not doing that right now. Uh, <laughs> the joy of experiential learning. I, Richard made me put this picture in here. He just made me do it. I'm not proud of it. And uh, so we have a lot of fun. And uh, there's our award-winning mascot, Aubie, and we're in the Tiger Motors lab. That's Jorge Valenzuela. He's our department chair on the right. And John Evans, he's a big part of what we do there. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? We have time for a couple questions. Yes? How much do successive generations of students start from scratch and how much of it is knowledge built upon previous generations of students? Like, do they have pictures that previous people designed or are they just given? Oh, no, no, we, that's a good question. We completely tear down all the improvement when we begin the class again. We've got to set it up to where they've got to figure out how to run this operation with none of the advantages that we put in. So it's one of the considerations of how do we, how do we take this down, how do we re-implement it for the next uh, class as they go through it. But yeah. even if we left those things, we'd expect them to find incremental changes to continue to improve. That's exactly right. It, it, every year, there's always something cool. RFID tube in replenishment. Students say, hey, uh, can we do this? And we go to the department chair, hey, you got 1,500 bucks. Uh, you know, and they do it, they implement it, and it works. So there's always, it, that's what I mean about the sandbox and their creativity. They, they just come up with some fantastic ideas when they're presented a system and, they, and they're allowed to play in this system. It's pretty cool how it works. Yeah, yeah, well, yes. In order to build uh, the cars, can you build 266 molds where there's only one fitting piece that it can be attached to that mold at, at any single part of the process? So that way you don't even, I mean, if that piece only goes into that one spot, by the time it passes on to the next person, you know, like, that has to fit into the mold. Well, 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 yes, you could probably, that's probably an improvement that we could look at. And, and that's, the, your very question is exactly what happens. We start doing the 3D printing. We say, hey, look at this. We made it. Boom, two seconds. We move it. You come along the next year and say, hey, why don't you just build a fixture where it's, it's intuitively obvious where the p pieces go. You don't even made it. You don't make a mistake that you have to correct. Mm -hmm. Now, that's true error proof. You can't even make the mistake. You, it's a good point, though, yes. The other, the other thing is, too, the fixtures themselves allow you to push very hard on the part. If you've ever built Legos and you push too hard and it snaps apart, you're like, oh, crap, i got to start again. It allows you to build it to higher quality and higher standard because you can push as hard as you want in on the standard and it holds it in place. I think that's you know, just another spin-off benefit. Of yes. Kind of a comment. So for me being the rookie here, uh, the, the coolest thing about the Lego lab is the fact that students are graduating. Yes. And the fact that over two and a half years, you walk in, you see that it's completely different. When Mark comes next time, he's going to see a, a $300,000 donation of the equivalent from Omron. And it's got a beautiful Lego. Yes. So it's, it, it's an awesome opportunity for us to really teach students how everything Thank you.
Yeah, and, and, and that's really a good point. In the Omron piece, this is a global automation company. We're going to be linking all these cells with integrated automation all through the process. It's much like an assembly plant. In the assembly center, it's probably about 80 to 90 percent labor, and the automation is a piece of it. So we're going to integrate all that automation so they learn the PLC, the robotic programming, vision inspection for that process, airproof picks from lights, many, many different things that we're going to be able to layer that with toward our goal of embarrassing manufacturers. Yes. And just one last comment. This also is not education, but it's also research. So we do a lot of, so when you think of the image inspection, usually in manufacturing, you have somebody just looking at it and doing a visual inspection on the, on the, on the screen. So we can do, this facility allows us to do real world research when we're saying, okay, what's the impact of the resolution of the screen, what is the impact of the screen size, whether you're showing the picture in color or not, with different age groups, with different vision capabilities, on actual quality.